Okay, so today's video is going to be a little different. You see, I had actually wanted to make a video series about various card games and my experiences with them, whether they be brand new card games that I'm trying for the first time or card games that I have a long seasoned history with. And one of the first videos that I've been wanting to make for the past couple of months was actually about a game called Duelist 2. And while I had prepared a script for this and I had prepared gameplay videos, I never actually got around to making the real video, the one that I wanted to be episode one for this new untitled series. And in while prepping for all of this, I came across a really weird Twitter ad that I'm going to see if I can find again, but I don't know if I, I can, about this new card game called Altered TCG. And... You By clicking this link, you could claim your username for this new revolutionary card game that had a Kickstarter. And we're kind of in this weird era now where so many different card games are coming out uh, that all promise this new revolutionary thing that's going to change the industry. And they always end up on Kickstarter. And more often than not, they tend to die or fade away with time. So I was already pretty skeptical about doing something like this. But claiming a username uh, really gets me on the hook <laughs> for some reason. I just really like securing the name Veek, uh, and I, I went for it. I, I logged into their website for the first time, and knowing literally nothing about the game i decided to log in make an account and uh see what this what this kickstarter would eventually be all about and why they were claiming it was going to be so unique so this video is going to be a little bit different uh it's going to be talking about some of my early impressions about a game that i have actually played but we don't know everything about there are a lot of promises and claims uh, about this game and as i've just mentioned it could go several different ways uh this is not a sponsored video i have never met any of these people this is just some player with a tiny bit of experience giving their initial thoughts and gut reactions and what i hope to be a very curious and honestly kind of critical manner. I'm not trying to have any disparaging comments, and I, I want to have genuinely constructive talking points, because I do think that a lot of the ideas that they present, um, both in and out of the game, are genuinely interesting, and there's a lot of potential surrounding all of this, but I think it hinges on a couple of key factors that they may or may not do well. So we're going to break this down into a couple of sections here, and we're going to talk about the game itself, uh, and then, you know, kind of my falling into this weird rabbit hole, uh, and hopefully maybe by watching this, I can explain some of the things that were honestly not that well, um, they weren't that great, uh, how do I word this, hmm. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm trying to say anymore. Uh, concepts that have not been portrayed to the public uh, in the best light or in the best manner. Uh, so with me butchering that intro, uh, let's go ahead and talk about, you know, my story getting into this and talk about what Altered TCG is and what they claim to do. So with this, Altered TCG is a little bit of a different game where as many other card games create this one-on-one -on -one, uh, combative gameplay scenario where you're trying to KO or kill the opponent or defeat the opponent or whatever, Alter TCG is closer to something like a, a race, something similar to uh, a game like Keyforge, if anybody has ever played that game before. Uh, the goal is not necessarily to defeat the opponent in battle, uh, more so get to the finish line, so to speak. Um, with this, I don't know why, and I this baffles my mind, but it took so long to try to figure out what the hell is actually going on in this game. I found so many resources about some of the auxiliary pieces um, that we'll talk about in a moment about how the game is going to be marketed in the future, um, how the competitive circuit is going to work, what some of their print-on-demand, yes, print-on-demand and digital ownership rights um, are going to look like. You may have noticed some of the QR codes on the cards. A lot of their new, we'll call them modernized uh, technologies and philosophies, there were so many resources on. But the hardest thing to find 
was actually how the fuck to play this game. So I want to talk about how the game works and plays in a nutshell because none of this matters if the game is not fun, especially when we talk about some of the other uh, elements outside of the game. Everything hinges on the game itself being fun. So I want to talk about how to play it uh, and talk about some of the genuinely interesting ideas that are brought to the table from a gameplay perspective. So first off, you have a deck of 40 cards. Um, so you've got a 39 card deck and a hero card. This is similar to something like a Hearthstone where you have uh, you basically choose a class and you get a hero power, essentially. There are six different factions, each with their own identities that we'll talk about in a bit. And in the base set, each faction gets three different heroes. So you basically have your own flavor of hero power to work with. As I've mentioned earlier, um, the purpose of the game is actually to win a race. So we're going to skip down a little bit over here. And you'll see that there is a, a, he a hero side and a companion side and these uh, tumult cards. Where basically the goal is to make sure that your hero and your companion meet up. So you'll be moving things on this side uh, towards the center and then similarly on the other side. You'll also notice that there is a, a hero expedition side and a companion expedition side. And you you progress these characters by, or you progress these uh, little tokens by playing uh, character cards, which are effectively creatures in other kinds of card games. And you compare stats and basically try to accumulate the higher stat to move forward. Um, that is an oversimplification of it, but essentially that's what happens. And there's a couple of interesting things that get um, remixed from other card games, especially if you're more used to things like your magics of your magics of the world or your um, like hearthstones and such and so forth. So one of the biggest things is that uh, first off, your mana system is I guess a little bit closer to something like a Duel Masters or even like a Final Fantasy trading card game or anything that uses that kind of system, kind of the, the modern mana system, where basically you have a starting hand of six cards and you put away, you put um, three of those six cards face down into your mana pool and you can tell that they cleverly made uh, the back of each card look like a mana orb and those cards that are put face down are your mana. So you actually start the game with three mana versus one, which immediately leads to some very interesting decisions because in games like, um, again, your magics of the world, and I hate you making that comparison so often as much as I do love magic, um, but you're not having to deal with a, you know, a one drop on turn one, a two drop on turn two, a three drop on turn three. You now have the decisions of placing, you know, one big three drop on turn one, or maybe split it between a two drop and a one drop, there are basically two different lanes that you are playing on. So you have to make the decisions of what units am I going to play and where, uh, what stats am I going to be contesting and where and when specifically. Um, another interesting thing about this game is unlike, you know, your magics of the hearts of the world. So sorry for making this comparison again. Um, the way that your turns operate are more of a back and forth, whereas in traditional uh, TCGs like um, you know Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon and Hearthstone and Runeterra and all these other card games, is that your opponent takes their full turn and then you take your full turn and then you know so on and so forth. What's interesting, genuinely interesting about this game is that when you play a card, your turn flips to the other player. Uh, the whole turn cycle, if you will, where everything kind of untaps and resets, uh, they refer to as, as days. So you're basically playing in, uh, you know, like, like your phases of a turn are like morning, noon, afternoon, dusk, and I think night are the phases. We'll talk more about this. It is night. Um, so basically, you could be on three mana and play a one drop, and then the turn will flip to your opponent, and then they could play a two drop. And the turn will flip back to you. And you still have two out of your three starting mana. So you can choose to take another action. Uh, you can activate abilities or you can pass. So there's constantly a back and forth just by nature of the game. And while it isn't as, uh, for lack of a better term, engaging as something like the, um, the stack and instant speed in Magic the Gathering... It is still far more engaging than these other turn-based games, uh, such as Magic and Pokemon, where I cannot explain how 
boring, <laughs> genuinely boring it is to wait for my opponent to tutor six cards into their deck, play a bunch of things and combo off where I have literally nothing to do, and I'm checking, you know, Twitter or something. So that in itself is very interesting, and the gameplay decisions happen immediately from turn one, and your deck is not autopiloting itself. I think that's genuinely really interesting. Some of the other things that happen as well is that you are playing creatures uh, on these expedition um, fields. I don't know what they're actually called. The expedition areas, segments, something. And you're playing these characters. And, the, and cards look something like this, where they have a play cost, which is, you know, their mana cost. A reserve cost, which we'll talk about the reserve in a moment. And then they have these three stats here. So there's a stat for forest, mountain, and water. I think it's water, right? Yes. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> so they've got these stats and forest, mountain, and water. And then, of course, just like, you know, every other card game, there's some ability that they may or may not have. And then there's a faction. Um, you can't mix faction cards in this game. So that means, like, if you are playing uh, the Izmir, which are these purple guys, you cannot play something like Bravos, which are the red guys. So when you have a purple deck, you are playing purple-only cards. Sort of. We'll talk about that uh, when we talk about some of the other unique aspects of the game as well. But I really want to hammer the mechanics of the game down first. So, um, effectively, when you play a card, it hits, it adds these stat totals into its respective pools. So this guy would add four into forest and three into um, mountain, three into water. And the goal of the game is that by the end of the day, whoever has more points into whatever stats uh, this particular counter is looking for advances forward. And as you advance forward, again, when your two tokens touch, you win the game. So there's this back and forth of trying to figure out which side do you want to play your creatures on or your characters on? What stats are they going to add? And as these cards flip over, you'll notice that there are different biomes. And I don't know if they show it anywhere in here. Yeah, here's an example. So here, this biome is only looking for uh, forest and water. So your mountain stat, if you're playing on this field, is not that important, right? You could play defense if the other guy needs it for some reason. So in this example, this guy is comparing these three stats. So that means if Mike over here wins any one of these three in total numbers, his token moves forward. Conversely, if Ella wins in one of these two, then she moves forward. So there's this weird kind of like I'm paying attention to the stats that I care about and the stats I don't care about. Do my opponents care about it? Do I need to play defense to make sure that they don't move forward? Do I only care about offense so that I make sure that I move forward? Can we kind of meet in the middle and have a tie scenario where we both move forward? Maybe Mike wins in Mountain because Ella didn't care about Mountain, but maybe Ella crushes the water section. Actually, Ella does. I didn't realize that there are numbers here. Uh, so, like, Ella crushes the water section, so she moves forward. So there's a lot of really interesting back-and-forth gameplay. And then, again, you're worried about two different sides. And because of the turn structure, you play a card, and then your opponent gets to see what you did. And playing second has inherent benefits now as a result of this. So you don't always want to be the first player, which I think is really interesting. Also, when the day is over and everything is done, the cards don't go into discard, uh, and nor do they stay in the expedition. Up to two cards go into reserve, which is basically a secondary hand or exile or banished, not, I shouldn't use banished, because banished is discard. Um, it's the secondary zone where you can replay these cards again, up to two cards again if you want, if you pay their cost. So if you look at this guy here, He's got a four mana cost when you, play him, when you play him from hand. And then after you play him from hand and the day is over and the expedition's over, he moves down to reserve. You can play him again from reserve for three mana, so he's a little bit cheaper. Although this time when you play him, he's a one shot and he gets this uh, counter called fleeting where when the turn is over again, he goes away. Or when the day is over, he goes away. So they don't always stay in reserve back and forth. Reserve, you could use them one time. Of course, just like every other card game, there are mechanics that manipulate this and so on and so forth. We're not going to get too into that. We're just talking about the phases of the game. Um, and then finally, when the turns are over... Oh, actually, maybe I shouldn't say finally. There's a couple of other bits as well. Uh, you have landmarks, which are permanents. They're something akin to uh, equipment or artifacts or enchantments in other games, that type of deal. 
Um, and again, you can only have up to two of them. At the end of your turn, if you have more than two reserves or more than two landmarks, you discard down to two. There are card effects that, you know, interact with the reserve and discarding and so on and so forth, just like every other card game. Um, and then finally, again, when the turn is over, whoever wins on one side moves forward, whoever wins on the other side moves forward, which means that it's possible for you to be hyper-aggressive on both sides or hyper-defensive on one. And there are some very interesting uh, decisions that had to be made as you play the game. Um, also, you have your hero, which acts as a hero power. So once per day cycle, you can do an effect. Some characters spawn extra creatures or tokens. Uh, some characters, I shouldn't say characters, some heroes rather, uh, will buff up existing characters and so on and so forth. There's uh, several different options and things that you can do. Uh, one of my favorite abilities is that uh, there's a, a hero that just lets your... Uh, it forces your opponent to go first <laughs> every time, so you can react to what they do, and it's by choice. So you can choose to go first if you want, but oftentimes you're going to go second. And we've seen six out of the 18 heroes so there's still a bunch of things that we don't know and that's going to be kind of a recurring theme when we talk about individual cards is that we genuinely don't know everything um finally when this is all over and a new turn starts there is a first turn first turn first player counter what is it first player marker so this little counter over here goes from uh player one to the other player and this denotes who goes first so basically on turn one, let's say Mike over here went first, back in this example. If Mike went first on day one, on day two, Ella will go first. And then on day three, Mike will go first, and so on and so forth. Um, from here, you'll draw two cards instead of your typical one. And then you have the option to put one card face down in your mana pool, which also means that you have a decision of do you want to increase your mana pool and play bigger things, or do you want the additional draw power, which I think lends itself to faster, more modern gameplay. And one of the things that I do commend this game for is that there's always a decision to be made, and the games are very quick and very streamlined. And honestly, after playing a couple of games on a fan-made client called Exaltered, which I'll talk about shortly um it was actually pretty intuitive i just really wish that finding this document which is thankfully now on their website and finding some additional resources online um in a discord or something to talk about the game would have been so much easier like a how to play video or a um a how to play guy i mean there's again there's this pdf this pdf is the one thing that has actually taught me how to play the game so hey future vincent here while i edit this video there was a how to play altered tcg video made by the guys at main deck i haven't watched it yet but i just noticed that it popped up just while going through everything and collecting some of the, the b-roll type footage so uh definitely check this out i will link this down below and i also want to take the time to talk about x altered the fan-made game um, you'll probably hear past Vincent rant about that as well. So uh, lots of cuts here. Uh, again, this was a very sporadic video. I just kind of wanted to do things and get my raw thoughts out. So here you go. Also, I... Oh, crap. I'm definitely going to have to cut this in uh, because I don't remember if I talked about it. But X Altered is a fan-made game uh, that you've probably been watching footage of in the background. And I have to absolutely thank the creators of X Alter for making this thing because it is by and far the most intuitive way to learn how to play this game. I don't know what the future of Alter TCG uh, has in store for it in terms of digital clients or anything like that. I know that the X Alter team got to work with the Alter team for like their API and such, but this this application alone is the reason I got to learn the game and not get super fucking annoyed with the lack of information surrounding the game when I was first digging into this. And I'm so grateful it exists because after like one or two games, you really just get the hang of it. Um, there are some really interesting systems that are put into place like matchmaking. Uh, the devs are making negative money for doing this. So this is just out of love. Uh, if there's a way to support the developers, uh, I would strongly, strongly suggest, you know, looking into just, you know, passing them, buying them a coffee or something because that is the sole reason I genuinely got into the game. Like, the other systems and the other auxiliary stuff that 
you know, are in this video, like the QR codes and the digital market and the modified cards and stuff, that's all well and dandy. But having played the game and having a system teach me the game properly was the absolute best thing that could have happened for this game. And I don't know if the developers <laughs> gave these guys enough credit because I can't give enough praise for this. The game is not hard to learn on its own, but finding information about this game was such a pain in the ass. And again, I know there, there is the PDF. The PDF is cool, but like reading this whole PDF, having to sit here and try to dissect everything with a friend and us going back and forth to try to be like, Oh, okay, this works this way. That go like, it was so much easier just to have an automated game client walk us through the thing after we gave this PDF a once over and then go, Oh, that's how the system works in practice. Great. Awesome. Um, X altered devs. I hope these guys hire you and just let you make an official client because you guys did a fantastic job. Kudos to you. Back to the regularly scheduled video. Thanks. Other than that, I see so many other resources and so many other discussion points talking about outside factors that I had to bring this up first. Because again, as I mentioned, the game has to be fun. And I will say, this game has the potential to be a really good, uh, what I'll call a tier two card game. So I don't think in any world this overtakes the big three of Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. Uh, but I can see this sitting in line with something like a Flesh and Blood or a Digimon or One Piece card game. Um, I hate to say MetaZoo, but, you know, like those types of card games or Lorcana being kind of this tier 1.5 type game. Uh, these games are very quick. They are shockingly in-depth, especially as new cards get released. And they have some very unique systems in place uh, in and out of game that could make this a very strong contender for a player's game first. And I think that's going to be a big thing that we have to keep in mind is that this game is very player focused. And as a result of that, uh, some of the concerns that people have had from a digital aspect, especially collectors and investors, which we cannot ignore. I, I personally am a player first. I am very much not a collector or investor. And I think that's important for me to note when I talk about some of these other aspects is that while they are attempting to do some revolutionary things to change this industry, we have to base at least a certain amount of credibility on the existing industry as it is today, but also some of the implications that collectors and investors have had um, for the industry as a whole. And I understand that things are, they're trying to change and break that mold, but we have to use you know some of the historical data as a little bit of a backing knowing full well that this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. So um, I wanted to get that out of the way first. Uh, this game is genuinely really fun. I think there's a lot of potential. It's definitely something that I can see myself playing and kind of slotting in uh, casually and honestly, even competitively as well. I think there is um, some very interesting niches for a competitive um, circuit, which is going to play a very important role in this game's survival, I feel, uh, with how they've structured a lot of these other pieces. But I think um, as a casual player, it's very easy to get into. And the art style is very uh, pleasant for some. I will be honest, I'm very in indifferent and honestly kind of uh, lukewarm to this art style. I think it's, it's fine, if not a tiny bit generic. And I know a lot of people really love it. Um, the developers themselves are very proud of not just the artwork, but the depictions of the art uh, for it being nonviolent. And honestly, coming from like magic and even even Pokemon, which is still kid friendly, where there are depictions of violence, I don't care. Um, I'm happy that they are proud of being inclusive, and that's great. It's just it's very much not a priority for something that I look for in a trading card game. But for those who use that as an avenue to get into the card game, I'm very happy that it exists. So with all that, um, I want to briefly talk about the factions really quickly, just to go over some of the, the depths and talk about the cards and some of the unique aspects that happen with the game. I'm going to go over them again, very briefly, because if you want to look at these cards and you want to dig more deeply into the game, you can. Um, but I, I, I feel like the factions themselves tie into some of the auxiliary parts of the game, uh, which I find very interesting. 
So we're going to summarize this super, super quickly, uh, starting off with Bravos. These are your typical, you know, red aggro, hit them fast, hit them hard type guys. Uh, one thing a little bit different about these um, creatures, or not creatures, characters, is that you have the option of going tall or going wide, which is kind of neat. Um, but you have really cheap, effective creatures that are susceptible to removal, and when they're gone, they're gone. And when you run out of steam, you're kind of toast. The goal of this is often to hit them on both sides, and hopefully you win before they start catching up and drawing cards and gaining value, because once that happens, you're toast. Um, from what we've seen, and I should bring this up right now, we've only seen the starter decks and a few of the cards that have been announced for the base set. We have not seen the entire base set, and one thing about starter decks in general is that they tend to be very light on things like removal and board clears and interactions, and they are trying to drive a sense of gameplay direction. So I think Bravos does a really good job at that. It feels very well-rounded, if not lacking in a couple of late-game strategies, but I think that was the intent. So that's that. Um, we also have Axiom, the steampunk value over time, take a trip into Value Town, uh, kind of artifact enchantment equipment style. Uh, I shouldn't say equipment, but artifact and enchantment style of, of, uh, of deck, where the idea is you play these really big permanents, and late game, you start sweeping, and you just overwhelm people with value. It's similar to something like um, the Abyssian in something like a, a Duelist 2. Uh, it's very similar to magic playing an artifact or an affinity style of deck sort of kind of um but the idea here is that you will gain a lot of value from playing permanence and permanent synergies um but the downfall being that these permanents are kind of really expensive honestly i will say thus far uh being so early in the game with no removal these guys are pretty strong and i think uh Everyone who has played this thus far kind of really loves them from their aesthetic to their gameplay mechanics. People just really like Axiom, and I think it's going to be a crowd favorite up front. Um, but we'll see how things go when the full set comes out. Next up is Ortis. These are your typical white weenie, go really wide and command a giant army type guys. Um, one really unique thing about this game in particular that I want to stress is that because of the two-laned approach, having just a presence on the board at all times in itself is far more menacing than any 1-1 one, one creature in Magic the Gathering or Duelist or Hearthstone or any other game could ever present. Because having a body instantly means that you are a threat, which because of that, uh, the gameplay, the gameplay from what we've seen so far has been very straightforward, but also very powerful. I, for one, typically hate creature-based synergies. I'm usually a um, either I am either on the super hyper aggressive boat or I'm on the super slow burning control side of the house. And creature-based strategies um, with you know creating wide armies never really appealed to me. But I gotta say, Ortis is pretty fun. Um, I, I don't know why, but it's it's hard for me to make a direct one-to-one -one comparison to traditional card games with the nature of how this game plays. But if you even if you don't like, you know, white weenie style gameplay, I would still say that this is it's a different take on what we've seen. Um next up is Izmir. Uh Izmir sounds a lot like Is It, so I thought I would like it because it's control magic style gameplay. It's a lot about interactions and playing really weak creatures to contest, and hopefully, an empty board after you have interacted with them and wiped them and bounced them back to hand or, or done whatever you need to do. Um, the threat assessment requirement of this uh, style of gameplay is very high. I think this is probably one of the more uh, skill intensive decks slash archetypes that we've seen thus far but just because it's skill intensive does not always mean that it's the best um there's a varying payoffs for a lot of work but if you like interacting with opponents and if you like messing with people and playing control style magic i think this is probably going to be the thing for you uh next up we have uh mana i think is what it's called but these are big giant creature based synergy uh, similar to like, you know, big green stompy or druid and hearthstone type type of deal where you have these giant creatures that 
they gain buffs and they don't go away. They're very hard to remove, but in exchange, you don't have a lot of removal yourself. Um, if you like the idea of a big, annoying snob of a creature who is very hard to get rid of and sticking a lot of eggs into one basket, this is your type of faction. Uh, and then finally, I don't know why this faction exists. I really don't. Um, but there's the Lyra, who is the dice roll mechanic. As an archetype. As a whole faction, even. Um, their whole shtick is you've got some kind of hit or miss creatures and you roll a dice and you hope that dice roll is going to be good. And when it works, it really works. And when it doesn't, it really doesn't. Um, a couple of interesting things, though, is that there are dice roll manipulation type mechanics on here. So there are cards that will allow you to roll a dice again and ignore, uh, you know, the lowest roll that you get. There are, um permanents that also allow you to do a similar type of thing so it's not entirely random you can hedge your bets so to speak i just don't know why this is in the game uh I'm, I'm assuming to appeal to a more casual audience i'm really curious to see how this goes long term but those are the factions in a nutshell from what we've seen and as you've probably noticed uh you've seen a couple of similar cards that look very close to being the same but are you know, slightly modified. Some of these are borderless. And if you've played other card games, maybe you've thought, oh, this is just getting the borderless treatment. But then when you look a little bit closer, you'll notice some of the stats are a little bit different. And some of the artwork is a little bit different as well. And they're slightly, quote unquote, altered. And that's because there are rare versions of cards. Every single card in this game thus far has a rare version and a faction shifted or color shifted version where a card that is normally in this case lyra could potentially be in a different deck actually this card right here this bravos pathfinder is a bravos card but as you can see it's in lyra so while there are no faction mixings there are certain cards that have been shifted over as a rare and the initial i guess question or concern or that people may have is well if things are just shifted to rare why can't i just play a bunch of these rares and move on with my life and there is a restriction in the game that to build a deck you may only have up to 15 uh rares or greater uh greater being uniques which we'll talk about next uh and you can so you can have up to 15 total rares with three uniques taking up those rare slots so you could have like 12 rares and three uniques or 15 rares and zero uniques etc rare cards are cards with increased or modified stats with the with an upgrade as you just saw here or they are uh shifted um color shifted cards so there is immediately a deck building decision that you have to make of do i want cards that are just upgraded versions of what i have or do i want slightly modified um or basically commons that I couldn't normally play. And I think that in itself leads to some very interesting deck building decisions. One other thing that we haven't seen in this game yet are unique cards, which are cards that are randomly generated with a, a an algorithm that is supposedly going to be semi-balancing where they are one of one type effects. So you might see a card with stats that nobody else has that only this particular person has. And immediately I could see you coming up with, uh, you know, um, red flags or concerns or, you know, comments about how the game is going to operate, especially at a competitive level. And that's fair. It's hard to say without having any initial um, indications of, one, what any kind of meta would look like, and two, what any kind of unique card would look like, because truthfully, we just don't have any info. Um, with that... One of the other aspects of the game um, that is going to make the whole uniques conversation really interesting is going to be this little QR code on the side over here. Because each and every card that exists in Altered is going to have this QR code. And by scanning a QR code for the first time on the application, you get to digitally own your card. And before I go any further, I want to say, and this is just me reading their FAQs and me doing a little bit of research on my own, uh, this is not an NFT, this is not, like, they're not using any cryptocurrencies, uh, this is not about any kind of 
digital age, you know, marketing scam or anything like that, right? Like this is just, this is more equivalent to altered the team behind this game, having a server and showing which things are in your inventory, uh, similar to how it would work if you were playing like an online game or something, right? Like if I, if I logged into Valorant right now and I had my skin collection or something, they would know that Veek XP has this particular skin. Similarly, um, I had to get that out now because there's a lot of conversations surrounding QR codes and there's a lot of really interesting, we'll call it, things that they are attempting to do with these QR codes. And I want to talk about them uh, because I feel really, I feel really passionate about this topic and not in a, not in a negative way and not in an overly optimistic way either, but we will call them... I'm very interested in this, and I'm curious to see how things will go, because I think there is a lot of potential. Um, but that also does not mean that I think that this is the absolute future or anything. I'm just really curious to see where this goes. Uh, so with that out of the way, this is not an NFC. Scanning the QR code for the very first time uh, puts this card into your account as you know digital ownership. Um, and with that... It allows you to do a couple of really cool, genuinely cool things uh, with these cards. First off, for competitive events in the future, they claim that you are able to do deck checks online um, by, you know, having your deck list there and then showing the legality of your deck and which cards you have, which I think is kind of neat. Uh, and then, of course, if you need to scan the deck live in person, you can because you should have the physical cards. Uh, second thing is that for competitive reasons, you could also see uh, who you played and when and what deck you were running and what deck they were running. You could also see stats, and I'm a really big stat nerd, so seeing like your overall win percentage or your run for this particular tournament at this time to see your matchup data, I think that in itself is really interesting. And there's a lot of cool potential surrounding that if done correctly. Also, one thing that I find very intriguing is that if you digitally own your card, you can print the card again on demand whenever, kinda. So the, a lot of these details are still to be determined, especially when it comes to things like pricing, delivery dates, bulk ordering, etc. So I don't, while I don't have all the information, I'm only going off of their promise or their statements thus far. So again, just like everything else in this video, things are subject to change. But the idea is that if you own a card, you can print that card as many times as you want and put it into multiple of the decks you own. So if you've ever played Magic the Gathering and you've played Commander, it's very annoying to have to buy a $30 card six times because you want to put it in six different decks. And that leads to people uh, proxying their cards or using worse versions of cards because they don't want to have to pay the same thing over and over again. And I'm not going to talk about the the financial impact that that has quite yet. I think that's probably a, a conversation for uh, another section of this video all on its own. But from a, from a player's perspective, that's genuinely really interesting. Another thing that they want to do with these QR codes is they are trying to have a digital marketplace where you can buy, sell, and auction uh, cards off to other players. Uh, from a competitive aspect, that allows you to do a couple of things. It allows you to find these unique cards based on what you want. So I guess it would be something akin to like a uh, a Path of Exile or a Diablo kind of auction house type thing where you're looking for this one specific piece of equipment that you you know, know statistically probably has to exist and you just got to find it. Um, hypothetically, you could do the same thing with altered and cards looking for, uh, you know, that one specific unique that you need, and that would drive price up. Um, however, once you acquire the card uh, digitally, so somebody sells it to you, and they transfer the digital ownership of that card to you, you got a couple of options. Obviously, they can mail you the card, or you could just print the card yourself, in theory. That's at least the, the promise that they have. Uh, the consequence of doing this is that the original owner of the card can no longer play that card in competitive um, uh, circuits. So if they go to a tournament, due to the deck check process that they have, 
uh, that player can no longer use that card, but they can still play it, you know, casually with friends or whatever. Or, you know, like normally you would just mail the card. And if the card makes it to that other person, excellent. And if it doesn't and uh, maybe it's lost or stolen or broken or damaged or not in the right condition or whatever, uh, that player can get it reprinted. Uh, maybe you order a card from a guy in like Japan or something and then it's in Japanese and you need it in English, you could reprint that card in English. And that in itself hosts a massive, massive suite of questions. I thought, I first off, I thought I read somewhere, and I could be wrong on this, that cards have an internal clock on them of reprinting them, so you can only print them once a year. Um, so I, I, then again, I read somewhere else that uh, if you own the card, you can print it as many times as you want. So I don't really know what the full circumstances of that are. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe I edit this in. Maybe I don't. I probably won't. <laughs> but there's already a couple of questions on that. There are, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions surrounding uh, the overall financial impact of, of the game. And as an investor, and not even just as an investor as in somebody who buys a bunch of sealed product and then flips that product at a later date, you know, a couple of years time from now or whatever. But as like, like, let's say a local game store, what are the implications of doing something like that? Because you've effectively killed off a singles market, so to speak, because now I shouldn't say you killed it off because that's not entirely true. Uh, but you have to kind of do interesting workarounds now. Like as a local game store, do you only sell sealed product or do you maybe have a system where you make a store account and you have to trade the digital rights ownership to the store when you sell a single. Um, no one, I, again, I'm not an, a local game store owner and I am not going to pretend like I know anything about that side of the house um, or you know the market surrounding there. I'm just a player. But I think that leads to some very interesting uh, conversation around it because as, a, as, the, um, as the company behind Altered, Obviously, they're trying to make money. They have to make money. They have to sell cards for this to continue doing its own thing. And they also have to have proper rewards to keep things uh, interesting. And by not really having a singles market that could potentially be viable for investors and local game store owners, they have to find other ways to incentivize people to play the game, namely the players. Because from a casual perspective there really isn't much of a need to buy the super expensive cards, right? Like, you could just, you, you as a player, like, I could build a deck and give it to my wife who has never played the game before and just reprint her a potentially really expensive deck. And to me, it's worthless, or maybe it's, like, worth, you know, 5, 20, 50 bucks, or whatever it costs to print a deck of 40 cards. But my wife now really doesn't have an incentive to go and like digitally own and get the rights to cards and like get into the competitive circuit unless she decides that she really loves the game and wants to play it or something. I think it leads to some interesting conversation. I'm not saying that the singles market is completely dead. I think you can work around it. And I think it's a, a new adjustment that would potentially have to be had, but is it worth it? Is it worth that hassle for a brand new Kickstarter game that, you know, maybe it can be a tier two type of game uh, that I, I can't really speak of. And for that reason, I think that the altered team has to create a genuinely compelling uh, competitive environment. And that's going to be really interesting with things like Uniques existing. I don't really know how that's going to work. Nobody really knows how it's going to work. Uh, but I can say that the gameplay itself has a lot of very interesting interactions and engagements. And I think the potential is there. But... I'm just really, I'm concerned, we'll say, or I'm intrigued, rather, at how they're going to pull something like this off. I think having local events uh, is good. I think if they can create a competitive infrastructure that incentivizes players to keep playing, even at, like, a casual competitive level where they just go to their local game stores and they have the equivalent of something like a Friday Night Magic to get promos, I think that in itself is already really good, right? And then if you can have a whole tournament circuit, that's even better, uh, but then you have to think about prizes and, and things like that. And one of the really cool things, or one of the really interesting things that they do is inside of your booster packs, they give out what are called foilers, which you can basically use to cash in a card and turn it into a foil. Um, kind of like a wild card in Magic, or kind of like using dust in another game. It's not one-to-one, -one, but you could basically upgrade your cards, which I think is really neat. Um, 
there's a lot of really interesting things that they can do as a card game. And also, a lot of people have said this as well about like the QR codes in the front. You know, people have asked, why don't you put them in the back or whatever, whatever. I just want to say, first off, as a player, having played the game uh, on Exaltered and um, messing with it for a couple of hours, you really just don't like you lose track of the card, uh, the QR code entirely as you're playing the game. Like it just kind of like goes away. And while I understand the argument of wanting to put it on the back, there are some concerns about how that would operate from a gameplay perspective. Like if you're doing a deck check, you have to unsleeve every single card. I get where they're coming from. I'm very indifferent on this topic, but I will say that having it on the front and playing the game, you don't really care. <laughs> like nobody cares. It's fine. Um, so with that, I think Altered has some really intriguing concepts. I keep saying that word, but their Kickstarter starts on the 30th of January. I have now been watching it very patiently. I'm probably, depending on the prices, I will probably end up investing a little bit into this from a, a player's perspective. Maybe I'll buy, I'll probably buy the starter decks. I will, I might buy a booster box and such. Um, Game Genic is also making a, I don't know what it's called. They called it a deck wallet or something like that. It looks pretty cool. I'll probably end up getting that because Game Genic makes cool accessories. But yeah, Game Genic is making a deck wallet, which I think is pretty sweet. And I'll probably end up picking one of these things up because I think the game has genuine potential. I think it has the potential to shake up the industry if and only if the game succeeds as a game first. I think most of what I've heard touts a lot about the game's extra stuff, which is all well and dandy. But I really hope that with their team, they focus a lot on incentivizing players and prioritizing players while still keeping up the morale of things like local game store owners and tournament organizers and such. Because I think without the inherent backing of an investor pulling money into uh in like into collections and similarly collectors buying a boatload of boxes i think it's gonna have to first and foremost look at the players um which i i think is fine but i think a lot of tcg players as a whole are of the mindset that if cards don't hold value i don't want to play it uh, and I think that's kind of just fundamentally the wrong way to look at it. It's very hard to break that mentality because we are trained to say that, you know, this is a very rare card. It's worth hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars or something crazy. And this was a game made by effectively board game players where the game pieces and the random nature uh, and the volatility of prices for trading card games is not a pro, but a con to not just board game players, but a lot of regular human beings. And that's fair. That's valid. That's actually one of my primary criticisms of card games because I don't play card games to invest or to hold any kind of financial value. I think there are better <laughs> uh, places to do that. And I'm not condoning anybody for doing that. I totally understand it. But I think making a game that kind of not eliminates that that avenue, but um, minimizes the the impact of that. I think is very interesting. Um, we'll see how things go. I'll be watching kind of with bated breath, and I wouldn't mind making more of these videos if people are interested in it, um, specifically with Altered or any other card game. And as you've heard me say, I will be making a Duelist video in the very near future. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely interested. We'll see how the Kickstarter goes, and I don't know, maybe I'll do a box opening uh, if I end up buying some stuff, if anybody's there interested. The box opening is going to be really weird, though, because I have to hide my QR codes or scan them before I reveal the cards or something. I don't know. There's, there's definitely this game, and I think the reason I am intrigued is that almost every single aspect of this game forces me to think a little bit differently. And that's not inherently good or bad. It's just different. And we'll see how things pan out. So thank you all for watching or listening. Um, if you're interested in this, I will post all the links in the description down below. Again, I have zero affiliation with this. I found this on a Twitter ad. Uh, and they really, they got me with the claim your username type thing. But yeah, 
Game seems cool. I will uh, catch you guys later. Peace out.